Good day to you all, dear ones, and welcome to this 16th day of February. It is day 47 in our journey through the Bible. Hello to everyone out there. My name's Hunter. I am your brother and Bible reading coach, someone who shows up with you every day to spend a little time together in the pages of the Bible. And we're going to let the Bible do what it does and point the way to the one who is the living Word of God, the one alone who has the words of life. And I'm talking about Jesus here, my friend. We come to Him. We train our hearts in His way of life. So I am glad that you are here. And today we are in the book of Leviticus, chapters 26 and 27. And we will finish our reading in Acts chapter 23. This is the word of the Lord. Leviticus 26. Do not make idols or set up carved images or sacred pillars or sculptured stones in your land so you may worship them. I am the Lord your God. You must keep my Sabbath days of rest and show reverence for my sanctuary. I am the Lord. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you seasonal rains. The land will then yield its crops, and the trees of the field will produce their fruit. Your threshing season will overlap with the grape harvest, and your grape harvest will overlap with the season of planting grain. You will eat your fill and live securely in your own land. I will give you peace in the land, and you will be able to sleep with no cause for fear. I will rid the land of wild animals and keep your enemies out of your land. In fact, I will chase down your enemies and slaughter them with your swords. Five of you will chase a hundred, and a hundred of you will chase ten thousand. All your enemies will fall beneath your sword. I will look favorably upon you, making you fertile and multiplying your people, and I will fulfill my covenant with you. You will have such a surplus of crops that you will need to clear out the old grain to make room for the new harvest. I will live among you. And I will not despise you. I will walk among you. I will be your God and you will be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt so you would no longer be their slaves. I broke the yoke of slavery from your neck so you can walk with your heads held high. However, if you do not listen to me or obey all these commands, and if you break my covenants by rejecting my decrees, treating my regulations with contempt, and refusing to obey my commands, I will punish you. I will bring sudden tears upon you, wasting diseases and burning fevers that will cause your eyes to fail and your life to ebb away. You will plant your crops in vain because your enemies will eat them. I will turn against you, and you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you and you will run even when no one is chasing you. And if, in spite of all this, you still disobey me, I will punish you seven times over for your sins. I will break your proud spirit by making the skies as unyielding as iron and the earth as hard as bronze. All your work will be for nothing, for your land will yield no crops and your trees will bear no fruit. If even then you remain hostile toward me and refuse to obey me, I will inflict disaster on you seven times over for your sins. I will send wild animals that will rob you of your children and destroy your livestock. Your numbers will dwindle and your roads will be deserted. And if you fail to learn the lesson and continue your hostility toward me, then I myself will be hostile toward you. I will personally strike you with calamity seven times over for your sins. I will send armies against you to carry out the curse of the covenant you have broken. When you run to your towns for safety, I will send a plague to destroy you there, and you will be handed over to your enemies. I will destroy your food supply so that ten women will only need one oven to bake bread for their families. They will ration your food by weight, and though you have food to eat, you will not be satisfied. If in spite of all this you still refuse to listen and still remain hostile toward me, then I will give full vent to my hostility. I myself will punish you seven times over for your sins. Then you will eat the flesh of your own sons and daughters. I will destroy your pagan shrines and knock down your places of worship. I will leave your lifeless corpses piled on top of your lifeless idols, and I will despise you. I will make your cities desolate and destroy your places of pagan worship. 
I will take no pleasure in your offerings that should be a pleasing aroma to me. Yes, I myself will devastate your land, and your enemies who come to occupy it will be appalled at what they see. I will scatter you among the nations and bring out my sword against you. Your land will become desolate and your cities will lie in ruins. Then at last the land will enjoy its neglected Sabbath years as it lies desolate while you are in exile in the land of your enemies. The land will finally rest and enjoy the Sabbaths it missed. As long as the land lies in ruins, it will enjoy the rest you never allowed it to take every seventh year while you lived in it. And for those of you who survive, I will demoralize you in the land of your enemies. You will live in such fear that the sound of a leaf driven by the wind will send you fleeing. You will run as though fleeing from a sword and you'll fall even when no one is pursuing you. Though no one is chasing you, you will stumble over each other as fleeing from a sword. You will have no power to stand up against your enemies. You will die among the foreign nations and be devoured in the land of your enemies. Those of you who still survive will waste away in your enemies' lands because of their sins and the sins of their ancestors. But at last my people will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors for betraying me and being hostile toward me. When I have turned their hostility back on them and brought them to the land of their enemies, then at last their stubborn hearts will be humbled and they will pay for their sins. Then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. For the land must be abandoned to enjoy its years of Sabbath rest as it lies deserted. At last the people will pay for their sins, for they have continually rejected my regulations and despised my decrees. But despite all this, I will not utterly reject or despise them while they are in exile in the land of their enemies, I will not cancel my covenant with them by wiping them out, for I am the Lord their God. For their sakes I will remember my ancient covenant with their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of all the nations, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. These are the decrees, regulations, and instructions that the Lord gave through Moses on Mount Sinai as evidenced of the relationship between himself and the Israelites. Leviticus 27 The Lord said to Moses, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. If anyone makes a special vow to dedicate someone to the Lord by paying the value of that person, here is the scale of values to be used. A man between the ages of 20 and 60 is valued at 60 shekels of silver, as measured by the sanctuary shekel. A woman of that age is valued at 30 shekels of silver. A boy between the ages of 5 and 20 is valued at 20 shekels of silver. A girl of that age is valued at 10 shekels of silver. A boy between the ages of 1 month and 5 years is valued at 5 shekels of silver. A girl of that age is valued at 3 shekels of silver. A man older than 60 is valued at 15 shekels of silver. A woman of that age is valued at 10 shekels of silver. If you desire to make such a vow but cannot afford to pay that required amount, take the person to the priest. He will determine the amount for you to pay based on what you can afford. If your vow involves giving an animal that is acceptable as an offering to the Lord, any gift to the Lord will be considered holy. You may not exchange or substitute it for another animal, neither a good animal for a bad one, nor a bad animal for a good one. But if you do exchange one animal for another, then both the original animal and its substitute will be considered holy. If your vow involves an unclean animal, one that is not acceptable as an offering to the Lord, then you must bring the animal to the priest. He will assess its value, and his assessment will be final whether high or low. If you want to buy back the animal, you must pay the value set by the priest plus 20%. If someone dedicates a house to the Lord, the priest will come to assess its value. The priest's assessment will be final whether high or low. If the person who dedicated the house wants to buy it back, he must pay the value set by the priest plus 20%. Then the house will again be his. If someone dedicates to the Lord a piece of his family property, its value will be assessed according to the amount of seed required to plant it, 50 shekels of silver for a field planted with five bushels of barley seed. If the field is dedicated to the Lord in the year of Jubilee, then the entire assessment will apply. But if the field is dedicated after the year of Jubilee, the priest will assess the land's value in proportion to the number of years left until the next year of Jubilee. Its assessed value is reduced each year. If the person who dedicated the field wants to buy it back, he must pay the value set by the priest plus 20%. Then the field will again be his. 
But if he does not want to buy it back, and it is sold to someone else, the field can no longer be bought back. When the field is released in the year of Jubilee, it will be holy, a field specially set apart for the Lord. It will become the property of the priests. If someone dedicates to the Lord a field that he has purchased, but is not part of his family's property, the priest will assess its value based on the number of years left until the next year of Jubilee. On that day, he must give the assessed value of the land as a sacred donation to the Lord. In the year of Jubilee, the field must be returned to the person from whom he purchased it, the one who inherited it as family property. All the payments must be measured by the weight of the sanctuary shekel, which equals 20 garas. You must not dedicate a firstborn animal to the Lord, for the firstborn of your cattle, sheep, and goats already belongs to him. However, you may buy back the firstborn of a ceremonially unclean animal by paying the priest's assessment of its worth, plus 20%. The priest will sell it at its assessed value. However, anything specially set apart for the Lord, whether a person, an animal, or a family property, must never be sold or brought back. Anything devoted in this way has been set apart as holy, and it belongs to the Lord. No person, specially set apart for destruction, may be bought back. Such a person must be put to death. One-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to Him as holy. If you want to buy back the Lord's tenth of the grain or fruit, you must pay back its value plus 20%. Count off every tenth animal from your herds and flocks, and set them apart for the Lord as holy. You must not pick and choose between good and bad animals, and you may not substitute one for another. But if you do exchange one animal for another, then both the original animal and its substitute will be considered holy and cannot be bought back. These are the commands that the Lord gave through Moses on Mount Sinai for the Israelites. Acts 23 Gazing intently at the high council, Paul began, Brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. Instantly, Ananias the high priest commanded those close to Paul to slap him on the mouth. But Paul said to him, God will slap you, you corrupt hypocrite. What kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that? Those standing near Paul said to him, Do you dare to insult God's high priest? I am sorry, brothers, I didn't realize he was the high priest, Paul replied. For the scriptures say you must not speak evil of any of your rulers. Paul realized that some of the members of the high council were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. So he shouted, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, as were my ancestors, and I am on trial because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. This divided the council, the Pharisees against the Sadducees, for the Sadducees say there is no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the Pharisees believe in all these. So there was a great uproar. Some of the teachers of religious law who were Pharisees jumped in and began to argue forcefully. We see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. Perhaps a spirit or an angel spoke to him. And the conflict grew more violent. The commander was afraid they would tear Paul apart. So they ordered his soldiers to go and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress. That night, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Be encouraged, Paul. Just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. The next morning, a group of Jews got together and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 of them in the conspiracy. They went to the leading priests and elders and told them, We have bound ourselves with an oath to eat nothing until we have killed Paul. So you and the high council should ask the commander to bring Paul back to the high council again. Pretend you want to examine his case more fully. We will kill him on the way. But Paul's nephew, his sister's son, heard of their plan and went to the fortress and told Paul. Paul called for one of the Roman officers and said, Take this young man to the commander. He has something important to tell him. So the officer did, explaining, Paul the prisoner called me over and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took his hand, led him aside, and asked, What is it you want to tell me? Paul's nephew told him, Some Jews are going to ask you to bring Paul before the high council tomorrow, pretending they want to get more information. But don't do it. There are more than forty men hiding along the way, ready to ambush him. They have vowed not to eat or drink anything until they have killed him. They are ready now, just waiting for your consent. Don't let anyone know you told me this, the commander warned the young man. 
Then the commander called two of his officers and ordered, Get two hundred soldiers ready to leave for Caesarea at nine o'clock tonight. Also take two hundred spearsmen and seventy mounted troops. Provide horses for Paul to ride and get him safely to Governor Felix. Then he wrote this letter to the governor. From Claudius Lysias to His Excellency Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by some Jews, and they were about to kill him when I arrived with the troops. When I learned that he was a Roman citizen, I removed him to safety. Then I took him to their high council to try to learn the basis of their accusations against him. I soon discovered the charge was something regarding their religious law, certainly nothing worthy of imprisonment or death. But when I was informed of a plot to kill him, I immediately sent him on to you. I have told his accusers to bring their charges before you. So that night, as ordered, the soldiers took Paul as far as Antipatris. They returned to the fortress the next morning, while the mounted troops took him on to Caesarea. When they arrived in Caesarea, they presented Paul and the letter to Governor Felix. He read it and asked Paul what province he was from. Cilicia, Paul answered. I will hear your case myself when your accusers arrive, the governor told him. Then the governor ordered him kept in the prison at Herod's headquarters. And now may our Lord give his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. Amen. Paul is suffering again from the very beginning, from the very first moment he's knocked off his horse on the way to Damascus. He's told by none other than Jesus himself that there would be suffering in his life and that he would suffer much for Christ's sake. He would appear before kings, Gentile and Jew alike. This would be his destiny, suffering. Over and over again we see him suffering. But God didn't just say, you're going to suffer a lot, Paul, and then leave it at that. No, with this proclamation came a prescription. He was going to see Jesus with great clarity. In fact, we're told that scales came off of his eyes. He had a vision of Jesus. This clear vision of Jesus was to be the prescription for the suffering that he would encounter all through his life, whether he was in jail or alongside those he loved. The prescription and the power was a vision of Jesus. Time and time again, the Lord renews Paul's vision by enabling him to see Jesus in the midst of his suffering. After being arrested, alone falsely accused, under threat of murder by a plot of assassins, in the midst of all this, the Lord appears to Paul. The word that Jesus speaks to Paul at that dark moment is, Be encouraged. Just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. Be encouraged. That's the word. Jesus shows up and Paul sees him. And the prescription in this time of great threat and suffering is to be encouraged. Are you under threat? Are you suffering? Is this a dark night for you too? Have the pressures mounted? God will always offer you a vision of himself. Jesus says so. Hear his words right now and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Be encouraged. I'm with you. His purposes for your life will not fail. He's working out something of great significance of eternal weight and glory. Through this light and temporary afflictions, he's working something out in your life. So be encouraged. Look at him. His prescription for your suffering is a vision of himself. Hold on to that. He's there. He's present. He's with you right now. May your heart be encouraged and may your eyes remain on him. That's the prayer that I have for my own soul. That's the prayer that I have for my family, for my wife, my daughters, my son. And that's the prayer that I have for you. May it be so. Let's continue now in a time of prayer. Feel free to read along with these prayers in the show notes of today's podcast. 
and meditate on these words that are being spoken over you, your family, and our world. And now, let us pray. Lord God, Almighty and Everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we might not fall into sin or be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far and those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your Spirit on all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Lord, grant that I might not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in the giving that we receive, in the pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in the dying that we are born unto eternal life. Amen. And now as our Lord has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power of and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to thank you for joining me today in our time through the scriptures and in prayer. I wanted to share something with you before next week comes rolling around. And that thing is this. Starting next week, we will begin the season of Lent. These are the weeks that are leading up to Resurrection Sunday. And it is a wonderful time for us to have our minds and hearts refocused in our walk with the Lord. And it can also be a great time for us to refocus in our commitment to being in the Scriptures. So maybe you've been doing really well up to now. And if that's the case, keep at it, my friend. And for others, maybe you're not doing as well at this goal as you had hoped. Well, let's not look back and worry. Instead, let us take this opportunity to go forward. We can take these days leading up to Lent to refocus our hearts. Lord willing, I'll be there with you. And the rest of the DRB community will be here as well. And we'll do this thing together. We'll take these steps through the season of Lent all the way to the cross into the empty tomb and we'll have our hearts our imaginations our spirits renewed and refreshed in the presence of god and the last thing i want to say before i let y'all go is thank you thank you to our partners who make this podcast possible these partners are listeners to this podcast they are just like you because they are giving we can give in return so thank you, Jody Poundstone and Joanne Chen, David Judah, Tanika Davis, Robert Sally, Leah Kephart, David Potyoke, and Anna Carlson. Blessings to you, my sisters, my brothers, my co-laborers in this work of the Lord. If you're listening today and you would like to join in with that happy group of folks, man, that is so appreciated and it is so needed. And all you need to do 
is head on over to the webpage dailyradiobible.com and click on that donate link. You can also find that very same link right in the show notes of today's podcast. And if you are old school, you can use the U.S. Post and reach us at Daily Radio Bible 2748 Northeast Molini Way, Hillsboro, Oregon, 97124. Well, hey, we've done it, and I plan on doing this again. Lord willing, and the creek don't rise. Your brother Hunter plans on being here. Until that time, let's go forward in God's joy. Let's let his joy be our strength. And let us always remember this. That you are loved. No doubt about it. Alrighty, I'll talk to you again tomorrow. You guys take care.